from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences around the world. I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. On the brief today, end to Curran on the maybe sort of U.S.-China trade deal. From London, Emma Chandra on the U.K. Brexit deal that appears to have a ways to go. And from Washington, Bill Ferries on the escalating conflict in northern Syria. So let's start with end to Curran. We have a treat of having him here instead of in Hong Kong at the moment. So we heard on Friday that there was a deal, and then over the weekend it sounded like the Chinese weren't quite so sure it's a deal. What's the truth? So, David, China have been managing expectations somewhat compared to the rhetoric that came out of Washington. For example, China via their state media or official statements have yet to use the word deal. They're talking about perhaps meeting the US halfway, you know, ongoing work, ongoing progress between both sides. So clearly there's something on the table. Clearly China does want to come and perhaps cut a deal. But um, by all accounts, there's still a bit of work to be done before anything is signed off. One thing that seems to be clear is the tariffs that were going to go into place this week, actually tomorrow on the 15th, are not going to go into place. What about the December 15 ones? Because you think that if they had a deal, they at least would have agreed on that. Yeah, exactly. Our colleagues actually have reported out of Beijing that is a sticking point for China. They, they've had a say of execution on the October tariffs, but they also want those December tariffs on the remaining 150-odd billion worth of Chinese goods. They want that threat removed. So far, that hasn't happened. And you'd have to assume, as we head into the APEC summit in Chile in November, that that will be a big part of the talks. Which is a deadline, because President Trump, President Trump said he wanted to sign something with President Xi by that point. Do we know who's going to be doing the talking? Because that might indicate how big a difference there is. If Liu He, the vice premier, is involved in the talks, that sounds like more than just drafting. It does, and we've had that report out of Beijing that apparently it does still need that high level of involvement. We had Treasury Secretary Mnuchin today talking about lower level uh, officials. Look, I guess it will be all of the above. Clearly, we need to get some more detail on this, and they've got a few weeks, but the clock is ticking now ahead of that APEC summit. There's a lot riding on whether or not they can at least agree on a truce. Okay, and a current, as I say, a rare treat here coming over from Hong Kong. He's our chief Asia economics correspondent. And now we go to Emma Chandra, who's over in London. So, Emma, again, we thought maybe they were in the final stages of a deal on Brexit, and then we hear from Michel Barnier, it doesn't sound like that. That's absolutely right. The more upbeat mood we were hearing at the end of last week really dissipating somewhat through the weekend and into Monday. And that's no more uh, better evidence than by the performance of the pound after hitting a three-month high and that putting in the best two days in more than a decade. At the end of last week, we're seeing the pound fall against the dollar today, down some 1.2 percent at the lows of the session. And the reason for this is that the EU are saying that those talks over a deal, those tunnel of talks, that we heard on Friday and uh, that negotiation, negotiators were entering into are still a long way uh, from some kind of resolution. We're hearing uh, that the proposals put forward by Boris Johnson are lacking detail. It means the next 48 hours, really, David, are going to be crucial because EU negotiators and the EU leaders really want to know how they are to proceed when we get to the EU Leaders Summit, which takes place on Thursday and Friday of this week, David. So, Emma, that's all fine and good, but what does the Queen think about it? That's what I want to know. Didn't the Queen give her speech in Parliament today? The Queen did give her speech in Parliament, reopening Parliament today, but we should remember that the Queen does not write that speech. The speech is written for her by her government, and her government is still headed up by Boris Johnson. Uh, now, in that speech, it was reiterated by the government through the Queen that they plan uh, to leave the European Union by the deadline of the 31st of October uh, this month. But, of course, we are still a long way from that. If we don't have some sort of deal agreed at the EU Leaders' Summit, it's then sh it makes it very difficult to put anything in front of Parliament uh, to approve. Of course, uh, even getting a deal in principle with the EU would still need to be approved uh, by Parliament. So we could be looking at next week uh, getting back into that discussion of whether we're crashing out with a no deal or if the Prime Minister can be forced to ask for an extension. Remember, of course, last month uh, British members of Parliament voted uh, to force him to request an extension in the face of a no deal. The Prime Minister has looked many times like he might try to fudge that. So we could be seeing the action move back to the court next week, David. Yeah, a couple of exciting weeks apparently ahead of us. Thanks so much to Emma Chandra reporting today from London. Now we go to Bill Ferries in Washington because, Bill, there were some real developments over the weekend. Not only the Turkish troops coming over into north, northeastern Syria, but also now apparently Syrian troops getting into the mix. Right, David. It's been a very tumultuous past uh, 72 or 96 hours. I think on Friday we were talking about the withdrawal of about 50 to 100 American forces. Now we're talking about the withdrawal of, of 1,000 U.S. forces. And into that vacuum are rushing uh, 
Turkish-backed uh, forces, as well as uh, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's troops, and they are both rushing to fill, uh, fill that border area that the U.S. previously occupied with uh, some of its special operations troops and, uh, and allied uh, Kurdish uh, militias. Uh, and there's still a lot of talk, there's still a lot of confusion about this policy, what exactly U.S. policy is in northern Syria at this point, what kind of red lines, if any, uh, President Trump has drawn for Turkey, and quite a bit of uh, tweeting by the president himself that there could be additional uh, sanctions of some sort placed on Turkey if, if it crosses those red lines, which have never really been described publicly. Yeah, Secretary Mnuchin of the Treasury keeps talking about those sanctions, saying that the president has authorized them, haven't been put into effect. Where is Russia in all this? Because the notion of Syria coming to armed conflict with Turkey is disturbing enough. But if Russia is supporting its Syrian allies, then we have an even bigger problem. Right. Russia is in a very interesting position here because uh, they have backed Assad throughout this war and are, are helping Assad's forces uh, rush north. At the same time, uh, President Putin has made a lot of, uh, a lot of outreach to uh, President Erdogan of Turkey and uh, has even sold President Erdogan a mis missile defense system. So Russia has uh, close ties with both sides in this fight, and I think that means it would be expected to be some sort of a negotiator between the Turkish uh, Assad forces on the one hand and uh, President Assad's forces on the other. Okay, Bill, thank you so very much. That's Bill Ferry's reporting today from Washington. Now we want to find out what's going on in the markets. We've turned to Abigail Doolittle. So I must say, thus far, geopolitically, there's a lot of uncertainty. Whether we have a China trade deal, whether what's going on with Turkey, what's going on with Brexit, where are the markets? Well, you're right about that uncertainty. Investors looking past it to some degree. Markets are basically flat. We, of course, have the bond markets closed for Columbus Day here in the U.S. So a bit of a quiet day. But right now you can see uh, the major averages trading right around flat. Apple, though, putting another all-time high. So there's some optimism despite all of this uncertainty. And trade is really the dominant topic, David, because it is what could affect the U.S. corporate profit outlook. At the end of the day, that's what investors and traders are going to be looking at. So last week, of course, we had President Trump touting this phase one deal. Today, as you were just discussing, China uh, not quite as positive. The devil is in the details. So a little bit more to go right now, investors feels a little bit tired. They're on pause. You mentioned Apple, which has been on something of a tear. Does that spill over into tech more broadly, which might affect, affect uh, trade, or is it really just an Apple-specific issue in that iPhone 11? Right now, it seems to be more Apple-specific. Apple's either, you know, really being loved or not loved by investors. Right now, it's feeling the love. If you look at the tech sector, also about flat. We do have Western Digital. They were upgraded at a shop. That's a, a flash memory company, chip company. Those shares are higher, uh, but overall, tech is kind of quiet right now. But if we do get a positive trade line out of uh, on the trade topic, you could certainly see the entire tech sector uh, surge because, of course, the close ties to China in terms of the supply chain and the revenues. Uh, and, of course, we are going into that all-important holiday season. So if there's thought that there's any hope that that December tariff headline or tar tariffs won't happen, that could really help out. That's the big one for our Christmas shopping. Yes, really, it is. It's close to home. Okay. Many thanks to Abigail Doolittle for a report on the markets. And now we turn to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, a former top National Security Council expert on Russia, is testing testifying to Congress behind closed doors today. Fiona Hill is the latest former Trump administration official to be subpoenaed as part of the House impeachment inquiry into the president. Hill resigned from the White House National Security Council over the summer. Her appearance comes despite a White House vow to halt any and all cooperation with what it termed the illegitimate impeachment probe. The U.S. says there's still time to slap meaningful sanctions on Turkey over its military actions in Syria. Following up on a story our Bill Ferries was telling us just moments ago, speaking to reporters outside the White House today, the Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin responded to lawmaker criticism that the United States' response to Turkey's offensive has been too weak. Secretary Mnuchin also said China trade talks are progressing. The current plan is there'll be deputy level calls this week. There'll be principal level calls next week with Ambassador Lighthizer and myself and the Vice Premier. If we need to have in-person meetings, uh, more in-person meetings to get this done, obviously we'll, we'll do that. Bloomberg has learned that China wants to hold more talks this month to hammer out the details of the phase one trade deal reached with the U.S. before Chinese President Xi Jinping agrees to sign it. Afghanistan's presidential election results should be announced later this month. Afghans voted in presidential elections in September despite Taliban threats and violence. However, the polling was marred by widespread misconduct and accusations of fraud. 
the world loses about $400 billion of food, $400 billion worth of food before it even gets delivered to stores. The United Nations says about 14% of all food produced is lost annually, with Central and Southern Asia, North America, and Europe accounting for the biggest shares. The wasting of food is drawing increased scrutiny because of the contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. More than 820 million people are estimated to go hungry each day. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks very much, Mark. Coming up Friday, we were told the U.S. and China had come to terms on at least the first part of a trade deal. But now it's not so clear. We'll talk with veteran trade negotiator Rufus Yerksa of the National Foreign Trade Council. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. seven chapters, what we said in the original agreement. Uh, in this case, intellectual property rights, uh, agriculture, which again is not purchases, is, is structural, currency. We broke the services chapter into two parts. One will now be financial services uh, and purchases. So I, I don't know, that's however you count it, three and a half or four of, of the chapters. And then as the president said, we'll move immediately to phase two. That was Treasury Secretary Mnuchin speaking earlier today about he sees progress made in U.S.-China trade talks last week. Welcome now, Rufus Yerksa. He's president of the National Foreign Trade Council. Ambassador Yerksa has served as the deputy director general of the World Trade Organization and also as deputy director general, no, deputy director of the office of the U.S. Trade Representative. He comes to us today from Washington. So, Rufus, welcome back. So, according to Secretary Mnuchin, we're halfway there, 50 percent away there. We've gotten three and a half out of seven. Is he right? Well, good, good afternoon, David. Good to be here. Well, I, I think business is, is a little skeptical of whether or not this deal has actually been finalized. I think we're going to wait and see what happens. You know, the, the Chinese are saying that they've got to come back and, and finalize things. But even if they get this deal uh, on this first uh, sort of tranche of, of agreements, it's not that clear that it goes very far. It seems to be some commitments to make agriculture purchases as well. The president's announced three or four times in the past that the Chinese have already agreed to that. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to have any fundamental changes in structural reforms in China. The tariffs that the president has already put on the Chinese aren't coming off right away. So the best we're going to get out of this deal is a delay in any further tariff increases uh, and some kinds of commitments on, on ag purchases. But frankly, you know, I doubt whether those purchases even get us back to where agriculture was before the trade war began when we had $24 billion in, in exports. The real question is how long is it going to take to get back to that level? So, Rufus, as you say, uh, there, there was some stuff that apparently was agreed to, not quite clear in phase one. There's an awful lot of things in phase two. But let's go to the question of the December 15 tariffs, because it's clear that they agreed yeah. to postpone the ones that were October 15, which would just be tomorrow. How could they have come to an agreement without agreeing what they're going to do about December 15 tariffs? Well, that's one of the things that's very unclear in this announcement, and the Chinese are saying very little about that. And so far, uh, all Ambassador Lighthizer has said is, is that that isn't decided yet. So I have to assume that we still have the risk of this escalating further. There seems to be something of a truce right now, but no real fundamental breakthroughs, I don't think. The problem for the president is, you know, he's still between a rock and a hard place here with the Chinese. He's not getting the kinds of structural reforms in their state-owned enterprises and IP and investment policies that he wanted when this negotiation began. Uh, and he still hasn't removed the tariffs. And if he increases the tariffs, it's bad news for the markets here. It's bad news for farmers. It's bad news for business. Uh, if he signs a deal which doesn't get these basic changes, 
people will say that his strategy wasn't successful. As we try to piece together exactly what happened last week and how far it went, uh, it doesn't inform us uh, the level at which the discussions are going to go forward just on phase one. I mean, you have done these deals. You actually have been a trade negotiator. Uh, President Trump on Friday said it's just a matter of reducing it to writing. It's a drafting issue. But now we're told actually Lou Herr himself may be involved in further negotiations. That doesn't sound like a drafting problem. Lou Herr usually, I would assume, is not taking pen to paper. Yeah, I think they had drafts earlier on in the negotiations, but it's not clear that there's a meeting of the minds on, on what w was in those initial drafts and whether each side has moved away from those positions that seem to be, you know, close to resolution last spring. Uh, things have unraveled quite a bit since then. And, you know, I know the administration's putting a good spin on this. They're saying, yeah, we've got lots and lots of things that are virtually agreed. But, you know, until we see a final deal, I, I think that's all going to have to be speculation. And certainly business is not taking any of it for granted for the moment. Yeah, we're talking with Rufus Yerksa. He is the president of the National Foreign Trade Council. So, Rufus, there is a deadline, apparently, of some sort with the APEC meetings down in uh, Latin America coming up in November. Does that put at least some sort of pressure on both sides to either get a deal or not to sign something? Because President Trump said President Xi would be signing something there. I know he said that. Uh, it's been a little less clear on the Chinese side. I think a lot will depend on whether they can reach a meeting on the minds on, on some elements of, of these, these texts and whether there's something for them to sign. I mean, you know, they can always sign a, a memorandum of understanding or a joint statement without, you know, it actually being reduced to a formal trade deal. I, I guess there's always the possibility that they will get enough of an agreement to actually sign some texts. The November uh, APEC meeting is not, you know, it's not a formal deadline. It's just a milestone because that's the next time the two leaders will be in the same place. And if Trump thinks it's to his political advantage to get a, something signed, I'm sure he'll try, try to do that. Uh, the Chinese seem to be stringing this along pretty, pretty well and, and not convinced that there's a deal there to be done. Uh, and so there's a lot of work left to, to get them to that point, I think. Rufus Jerk, so we tend to focus on the U.S.-China trade deal. It makes sense. It's number one, number two economy in the world. At the same time, we also have some issues pending with Europe and some deadlines coming up there. Where is the United States with respect to European imports and pot potential tariffs? Well, this is very worrying because, of course, you have the, the Boeing Airbus fight where we just won uh, a judgment in the WTO one of the few WTO decisions that the president seems to like, but uh, that gives authority to impose retaliatory tariffs on the Europeans because of Airbus subsidies. In the meantime, of course, he's still threatening to uh, impose tariffs on automobiles under Section 232, the national security law, and there is a sort of a November deadline on what he does with that uh, recommendation. We, we certainly hope that, that he doesn't escalate uh, the tariff wars uh, with other countries beyond where they already are with steel and aluminum. If he moves on these auto tariffs, I think that's going to be very, very bad news. Uh, the Boeing Airbus fight, I think the question is, are the two sides going to try to negotiate some settlement, some solution? Uh, there's some more pressure on both sides to do that now, I think. Yeah, we're going to pick up on Boeing in just a few moments. So many thanks in the meantime to National Foreign Trade Council President Rufus Yerksa coming to us today from Washington. Still ahead, big changes at Boeing as the board separates the roles of chairman and CEO. CEO Mullenberg squarely in the crosshairs for fixing the problems with the 737 MAX. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The Boeing 737 MAX is still grounded and there's no clear end in sight, which has led the Boeing board to take away CEO Mullenberg's chairman title to focus on this one big problem he has. Here to take us through is Brooke Sullivan of Bloomberg Opinion, who has followed this story from the very beginning. Brooke? 
I'm really surprised that it took them this long to come to this decision. You know, it's sort of been a long time coming. The MAX, of course, has been grounded for now seven months, and there's not really a clear time frame for how it's going to get back in the sky. Boeing has said that they expect a fourth quarter return, but European regulators have said we need more clarity on this fix to the software system. They're not entirely convinced that it does go far enough to fix all of the problems with that Boeing 737 MAX. And I think the longer this drags on, the more questions you have about Dennis Muhlenberg's credibility and whether or not he did everything he was supposed to do in terms of giving airlines the information they needed to plan without the MAX. And, and from, from the outset, at least, I have a question. Is this an engineering problem or is this a communications problem with regulators and with airlines? I think that the initial issue with the MAX is a design issue and you need to figure that out through engineering changes but this of course becomes a much bigger deal when you have two plane crashes and 346 people dead and that does become a PR issue at the end of the day and managing that relationship with regulators but also the public perception of this plane because remember it's not just about getting regulators approval it's how do you get passengers comfortable with flying that plane again and I don't know that Boeing is truly prepared to deal with that they're not a consumer facing company that's not historically been their area of expertise. Does the street think they have the engineering capacity to fix it? I think they do and I think Wall Street does as well and I think that's why you've seen the stock hold up as well as it has all things considered is that Boeing does have the engineering expertise to fix this and if the end of the day they're in a duopoly with Airbus where else are you going to get your planes Boeing of course is buying Embraer Airbus already bought Bombardier there's not a lot of competition out there which has kept them going but also may keep them from making the changes they need to make okay many thanks to Brooks Sullivan of Bloomberg Opinion and we're going to turn now to stock of the hour today we're looking at Johnson and Johnson the company's stock is lower today as litigation concerns loom ahead of the company's third quarter results Kaylee Lines is here to tell us about Johnson and Johnson yes yeah, so of course we'll get all those headline numbers before the bell tomorrow but the real focus is going to be on the company's commentary around all of these ongoing lawsuits. Now, we got news on several of them last week. It actually got two wins in regard to its talc baby powder products, but also was hit with an $8 billion fine in regard to Risperdal, which is one of its antipsychotic drugs. And those are just three cases in what they're facing is 100,000 damage claims for a variety of drugs, from opioids to these baby powder Risperdal issues. I mean, in total, analysts estimate the cost surrounding all of these different suits is going to be about $20 billion um, for opioids, for example, we know the big one. It's only 20,000 cases, but they estimate that cost could be about $5 billion when all is said and done, when you consider all of these potential global payouts they could have. Well, that's what grabbed my attention from the Bloomberg story here, that J&J &J faces 100,000 more damage claims after they take the $8 billion. Do they know how big the bread box is? Do they know how big the problem is? I think, frankly, the company can't say, you know, we know exactly how much liability we're facing here. They've already, in the last 12 months, paid out nearly $3 billion in settlements, and that's just, you know, in the past year, and that's, they have many Many, many more to come, over 100,000. Now, analysts say that when you look at the stock, some of that risk, at least the worst case scenario, may have already been priced in. One analyst over at Bernstein says they're pricing in about a $50 billion hit, whereas the consensus is more around this ultimately is going to cost about $20 billion. And you have to remember that for this company, unlike some of the others involved in opioid suits, for example, they have really stable long-term free cash flow. Their free cash flow in the past 12 months was more than $18 billion. So that makes that $3 billion in settlement payouts kind of seem like not a at the end of the day, it's not going to like financially do in this company, yeah. but it's still not something you want to see. And according to Bloomberg, investor. they do have a market cap of about $345 right. billion. <laughs> dollars, so it's, it's a, a pretty big company. Okay. Many thanks to Kaylee Alliance for the report on Johnson & Johnson. Up next, it's U.S.-China trade, but it's also ratification of the USMCA and continued government funding. A lot of issues facing Washington. We're going to talk with someone whose job it is to follow all those political developments as they happen to Evercourt, ISI's head of public policy research. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We come in with a red headline crossing the Bloomberg right now. The United States is reported to be poised to impose sanctions on Turkey as early as Monday. As we know, on Friday, Secretary Mnuchin of the Treasury Department came out and said that the president had authorized sanctions when appropriate, but would not commit to when it might be appropriate. Earlier today, he said, we're ready to go. Over the weekend, he said, we're ready to go. The report now is that they may impose sanctions as early as Monday on Turkey. Okay, now for Bloomberg First Word News, we go to Mark Crumpton. Mark? 
David, Russian President Vladimir Putin's in Saudi Arabia. He's meeting with the Saudi king and crown prince as he tries to cement Moscow's political and energy ties across the Middle East. It's Mr. Putin's first visit to the kingdom since 2007. The two nations are also likely to discuss ongoing tensions gripping the Middle East, including Saudi Arabia's standoff with Iran and Turkey's military campaign in Syria. Problems for British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his Brexit proposal. The European Union warns talks are still a long way from a breakthrough. Plus, Johnson's political allies are distancing themselves from his plans. The EU says the UK proposal for breaking the deadlock over the Irish border doesn't have enough details. Queen Elizabeth opened the new session of Parliament. My government's priority has always been to secure the United Kingdom's departure from the European Union on the 31st of October. My government intends to work towards a new partnership with the European Union based on free trade and friendly cooperation. Negotiators are trying to come up with an agreement that EU leaders can endorse at their summit that starts Thursday. Haiti's embattled president is facing a fifth week of protests. Roadblocks went up across the country after opposition leaders said they will not back down for their call for the president to resign. The demonstrations come a day after tens of thousands of Haitians marched through the capital, Port-au-Prince, in a peaceful protest. Anger has been growing in Haiti over corruption, inflation, and scarcity of basic goods, including fuel. The death toll in the most powerful typhoon to hit Japan in decades is now up to 43. More than 110,000 military and civilian personnel are engaged in rescue and cleanup operations. Heavy rains led to flooding and mudslides in central and northern Japan. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. The list of public policy issues is large and growing in Washington, from U.S.-China trade to the USMCA ratification to funding the government to impeachment investigations. Sarah Bianchi is head of U.S. public policy and political strategy research at Evercore ISI, which means she has her hands full right now. We welcome her now from Washington. So welcome. Good to have you with us. Let's oh, start with the U.S.-China trade talks, because we thought on Friday that we had a deal, at least for phase one. Now it's not quite so sure. What do you say? I think that there are still a lot of questions to be answered here. I think even if there is uh, complete agreement, which it's not totally clear uh, on the China side at this point that there is, it's still a very modest deal, uh, really boils down to agriculture purchases for some uh, modest lifting of the October uh, 15th. Uh, tariff increases and some kind of vague language on some of the other things. And so uh, I think that uh, CEOs and markets shouldn't feel uh, too much comfort. I think the other thing that has to people need to watch here is that by and large after these arrangements, the uh, Democrats have given the president uh, a fair amount of leeway on his negotiations with China. I think with the Democratic uh, presidential debate coming up, uh, there will be a lot of questions about the substance of this deal. Well, let's go to that point exactly, because you, as you summarize, the phase one seems to be relatively modest, some agricultural purchases, some transparency on FX, things like that. A lot of things in phase two that seem to be much more challenging. If the president could get to a deal on that phase two, the larger portion of it, can he implement that without congressional support? And would he have congressional support? There are a lot of things that the president can do here uh, without congressional uh, approval. Certainly, he has a lot of leeway on delaying uh, or eliminating the December tariffs that he's talked about. He's got a fair amount of jurisdiction around what he can do around Huawei and uh, uh, IP. Um, if there are things that Congress is too concerned about, particularly around Huawei, they could step in. But he's got a lot of leeway, and I think the challenge is, is that people uh, are starting to ask when are these substantive uh, proposals uh, coming and um, and has it all been worth it? And I think that that's what he's going to hear uh, for the Democrats, uh, particularly as 2020 uh, heats up. He's going to be just under more pressure. We're, we're talking with Sarah Bianchi of Evercore ISI. Sarah, when I introduced you, I said it's not just the U.S.-China trade. We also have funding the government. We've got USMCA. You, we've got quite a few other issues pending down there. To what extent can Congress both proceed in the House on impeachment inquiry and handle these other things at the same time? 
Well, it's challenging uh, as you as you list it that way. It does sound like a heavy to do list. But let look, Pelosi and uh, the House Democrats are under a lot of pressure to show that they can do both uh, because the Republicans are going to be questioning uh, whether this is all about relitigating the 2016 elections and can't make progress for the country. I think that Speaker Pelosi is sensitive to that criticism and that actually she will be uh, quite aggressive when Congress returns um, this week about moving forward, particularly on uh, USMCA, but also on the budget. Does she need that, the Speaker, uh, Speaker Pelosi, does she need that for her own caucus and particularly for some of the first year people who said they'd go to Washington and get something done? A hundred percent. She absolutely needs that. And USMCA is really the best opportunity that Pelosi has. Uh, there are There is prescription drug legislation that she's pushing as well, but the thought that that gets through the Senate is very much in doubt, given some of the uh, opposition from, from McConnell and others. So I believe that USMCA is her best opportunity. Um, she has the votes, and she, as you mentioned, she has caucus who wants. I think she's going to try to push it through when she returns. Analysts have suggested that the marketplace may be being affected by just policy uncertainty coming out of particularly Washington. We have Brexit as well, but particularly Washington. We are going into an election year. And President Trump certainly wants to be reelected. Might that give us some cause for some uh, confidence that, in fact, people, things may quiet down because the president is not going to get elected if he's got a lot of turmoil going on around the world? A hundred percent. I think that's a lot of what you saw at the end of the last week with China, uh, despite his. Uh, uh, posture early in the week and being very tough on China. You saw uh, him bring in leaders and settle settle this down himself. That is what we think we'll see with these December tariffs. That is what we think we'll see uh, with USMCA. It really is his best opportunity to settle down this economy is to try to eliminate some of the uncertainty. And so we think uh, you'll do we'll see that. The challenge is, is he may get drawn into some of these skirmishes if he sees a Democrat saying he's not tough enough on China. Um, in a debate, he may uh, feel compelled to respond. So there's still quite some volatility uh, to go here, but we do believe that overall his approach is going to be to try to settle things down. Well, and President Trump has been drawn into or actually inserted himself into a different kind of skirmish, so to speak, which is up on that border of Turkey and Syria right now. And he's getting a lot of heat from his own caucus, that is the Republicans, particularly in the Senate up on the Hill. Is that limited to the issue of Turkey and foreign relations, or could that spill over to some of the other policy issues up on the Hill? Well, that's a great question. I think we are waiting to see how Republicans respond when they come back in town this week. They have been sort of uh, at home and hiding as Congress has been adjourned. And uh, you are starting to see some of them saying not only on Syria, as you mentioned, but on other things around the Hunter Biden and whether it was appropriate to raise that with the Chinese. So I think there's a lot to see about um, a sum of what uh, of how Republicans will respond to this, but I think Syria it was a very clear cut case for for folks. It's a position uh, that has been held a long time, and so I don't think that uh, level of pushback that you saw from Republicans is um, is quite what you'll see in on other issues. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. that's Sarah Bianchi. She is head of public policy at Evercore ISI down in Washington. Coming up here tomorrow evening, Democrats return to the debate stage for the fourth time. We talk with a professor whose specialty is analyzing the impact of presidential primary debates. That's next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. I'm David Weston. Democratic presidential candidates are returning to the debate stage tomorrow for the fourth time, this time in the ultimate bellwether state, that is Ohio. The University of Virginia Center for Politics looked at presidential elections getting all the way back to 1896 and found that the Buckeye State and its 18 electoral votes has the best record of picking presidents, voting for the winning candidate all but twice. Here with a preview of what to expect from tomorrow's debate is Bloomberg national political reporter, Emma Kennery, she's reporting from Washington. So Emma, give us a sense, set the stage for us tomorrow night. What do we expect? Yeah, so tomorrow will be exciting. It's the first time that 
Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren are currently in a statistical tie on the Real Clear Politics average. Joe Biden's at 27 percent. Elizabeth Warren is at 26 percent. So it's really neck and neck. Last time um, they were still close. Uh, Warren had not surpassed Biden yet. She did last week. And they didn't really attack one another. So it'll be interesting to see if they go after each other this time. So Emma, going back at the, the prior three debates, did they make a difference in the polls insofar as the polls were reliable? I mean, the, uh, we certainly saw Kamala Harris bump up after the first, but then came back down. Has anybody do, clearly uh, benefited from or hurt from the, the, these debates so far? I mean, aside from the Harris bump, which Harris saw that bump and then she immediately by before the next debate had already gone back down to where she was at the beginning. So there really hasn't been um, any clear advantage out of coming out of the debates. Um, but we have seen Warren has been going on a steady increase, um, whereas Biden has remained around the same. It's kind of started to even out at this point for the past few months. It will be a big night for several people up there on stage, but perhaps none so big as Bernie Sanders, the senator, yeah. uh, because he had a health scare. He had a health a heart attack. He's going to show up. He's going to be on the debate stage. People, I suppose, are going to be really looking to see how robust he is. Yeah. So, yeah, so Bernie Sanders had a heart attack, and he had canceled all of his events since. This will be the first time that he's out there Um you know, out on the stage and talking to the public again. People were worried whether or not he would make it to the debate. He will. And then the next day, um, he plans on hosting a big rally in New York. Okay, thanks so much to Bloomberg's Emma Kennery reporting today from Washington. Tomorrow's debate is part of the primary process, not the general election. But according to the work of a prominent expert, the fact that it's a primary debate may make it even more important. And they certainly have made for some memorable exchanges. But you ought to be ashamed of yourself for jumping on my wife. You're not worth being on the same platform as I'll tell as my you wife. something, Mr. Clinton. Now, Don't try to escape it. It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, um, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> Oh, EPA? EPA, there you go. The American people are sick and tired of hearing about your damn emails. Thank you. Me too. Me too. This is a tough business oh, to yeah. run for oh, president. Oh, I know. You're a tough guy, Jeb. I and know. it's... In we remember all of those, I must say. Okay, welcome now, Professor Mitchell McKinnery of the University of Missouri, coming to us today from Columbia, Missouri. So welcome, Professor. As I say, you really have made a specialty out of studying, particularly the primary debates, and you've concluded that actually in some ways they may even be more important than the general. Why is that? Uh, that's right, David. Good to be with you. What we have found over several decades uh, since primary debates have taken off, uh, really back in the mid-1980s, and now we, we, we see these primary debates generally feature 10, 12, 15. We've had rounds of 20-plus primary debates. That's where we see much more movement in terms of commitment to a candidate, uh, vote choice, uh, than, say, a general election debate. When a general election debate comes around in late September, September, October uh, of the fall, uh, just a few weeks before the election, uh, we've, we've found very little movement, very little influence of a general election debate. Usually it's two to three percent of, of leaning or undecided voters may make a decision on that debate, whereas we've seen as high as 30, 40 percent over a span of several weeks uh, of, of, say, uh, one party's uh, voters uh, make their decision and they claim they point to debate performances by these candidates. Uh, in the primary debate. So for that reason, these primary debates really are uh, important, uh, can be important moments for these candidates uh, in, in persuading uh, voters. So, Prof Professor, uh, you went back, I think, about 20 years or so and take a look at all of these things. Uh, we remember Rick Perry last go around really got hit hard by having a couple gaffes in a row that really took his approval ratings down. In general, is the upside potential as big as the downside or is there a bigger downside risk? Well, certainly uh, we could point to the upside, and we see this tomorrow night uh, with a historic field of 12 candidates. This will be the largest field on one on a single debate stage. An upside for many of these candidates who, who have yet to gain really a national following. Uh, they may come from a specific state. They may have a statewide vote as a, as a U.S. senator, even a member of Congress. But in terms of a national following, uh, and we see this in a primary debate, 
state where uh, perhaps a second, the second tier sometimes we call them, maybe even a third tier out of a field of 12 candidates, try to capitalize on a moment, uh, try to find uh, some response that will propel uh, the, their narrative, that will gain some traction. Uh, then for the front runners, and this is what I think makes tomorrow night's debate particularly uh, uh, potentially pivotal, uh, we have uh, uh, now a number of, of front runners that are at a point of, of whether uh, uh, they're going to hold on to that front runner status for Joe Biden. He may be eclipsed by Elizabeth Warren. She may continue her momentum. And then what of Bernie Sanders? Uh, will his supporters begin to look at uh, his candidacy with some uh, skepticism after his recent health concern? If that happens, will that really change the dynamic? For example, will they shift to Elizabeth Warren, which seems to be a natural uh, constituency? Uh, if that occurs, then uh, will that spell some trouble for Joe Biden? So I think there's a number of interesting questions to be answered uh, out of the debate uh, tomorrow night. We're talking with Professor Mitchell McKinney, Professor of Political Communications at University of Missouri. So uh, with that in mind, looking at the front runners, the three or so front runners that you have, if you were advising them, would you advise them to play not to lose or would you advise them to play to win? That is to say, do they want to make a big splash or do they just want to avoid a mistake? Well, I, I think certainly if we if we take those three front runners, there there may be some differences. Um, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders has in his previous debate performances uh, really uh, delivered some vigorous uh, uh, debate performances, even to the point of almost ridicule with his very strong, sometimes blustery uh, uh, shouting. Uh, uh, again, will we see the same Bernie Sanders? I don't think he can play it safe. I'll, and if so, that may just continue the questions regarding his candidacy. With Joe Biden, uh, we've seen some uh, uneven debate performances, if you will, in the first three debates. Uh, there have been moments, there've been, actually there have been moments of people questioning, is he up to this? It, 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 will he maintain his front runner status? And now certainly with the impeachment inquiry that's going on, where he's center, his family, uh, his son, uh, the president attacking him. Um, uh, will we see a vigorous defense? Uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, again, uh, as she's emerging uh, uh, as, as a potential rival in that front runner status, will, will she be on the end of sort of an incoming barrage of attacks, which usually happens to a front runner? If so, how will she respond? Uh, I, I think we saw, interestingly, in her, her last debate, uh, which was the first time that she uh, was next to Joe Biden, she did did play it somewhat safe. There wasn't a lot of attack of other candidates. Um, uh, she faded a bit on that stage, letting Bernie Sanders try to defend some of the more liberal progressive policies. But will we see Elizabeth Warren continue that uh, approach? So uh, each of those candidates, uh, I think, have, uh, have some difficulties in terms of what they must do in the debate. And then that's only three of the 12. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure we'll likely see one of the other nine or maybe more, uh, really try to, to uh, capitalize on a moment and try to have a breakout moment uh, tomorrow night. Yeah, get some attention. I'm sure they would like that. Thank you so much, Professor. Really great to have you with us today. That's Professor Mitchell McKinney. He is Professor of Political Communication at the University of Missouri. Coming up, we have three new winners of the Nobel Prize in the Economic Sciences today. And our Michael McKee joins us to explain why their work is pathbreaking. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences was announced earlier today, and it went to three individuals, Anijet Banerjee, Esther Duflo of MIT, and Michael Kramer of Harvard. And the thing they share is their work on global poverty. This year's prize in the Economic Sciences is about alleviating global poverty. Now, how to reduce global poverty is a fundamental but also a daunting question. This year's laureates have shown that it's best to break down this daunting issue into smaller, more precise questions. Questions you can credibly answer. 
Welcome now to explain all this to us, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent Michael McKee. So welcome, Michael. So explain exactly what they've done that's different, that's path-breaking. Well, poverty is a very big, broad subject that's hard to get a fix on. The U.S. government has struggled for years to even define what poverty is. And so what these three have done in their work together and separately is sort of break it down into different tasks. One thing, for example, that they looked at was how to improve vaccination rates. It's not just a matter of throwing drugs in a country. You have to have a... A, a, a delivery system, a health care delivery system. You have to have doctors in villages to deliver the medication. And you have to convince people that getting stuck with a needle is a good idea. All of this kind of works together. They've worked on microcredit, how to help people at the bottom end get enough credit to start businesses and grow, things like that. Uh, and it's contributed to the decline in poverty around the, the world. It's hard to put a number on it. But by showing uh, results-oriented and detail-oriented, data-oriented work, can help. What's well, interesting to me, uh, sometimes when these prizes are announced, I'm not sure exactly what it is they're for. I, it's pretty abstract. This sounds pretty actionable. I mean, people can actually put this into practice around the world. That's why I got uh, so many cheers from economists everywhere when this uh, prize was announced, because it is a field in which the, these people have gone in and actually made a difference that you can see. A lot of what economic work is is conceptual and it's the kind of thing that you create a theory that helps somebody else solve a problem somewhere. In this case, they directly show the connection between economics and results. Yeah, and I don't want to take anything away from the work, which sounds like it's extraordinary and really productive. At the same time, we can't ignore the fact that we have a relatively young woman. Yeah. Esther Duflo. Which is different. We don't always say that with the Nobel Prize. She's 48 years old. Uh, that is, it is both remarkable because she's a woman. It's only the second time a woman has been named a winner. Eleanor Ostrom, the first one in 2009, took a long time before a woman was appropriately honored. And also, she is very young, which is unusual for Nobels because they normally give them to people for work they did decades before. It's sort of a prize at the end of your career. In this case, it comes early in her career. And for her husband, Batterji, uh, even Michael Kramer, all of them still have many productive years ahead. And uh, this is seen as an effort by the Nobel Committee to yeah. encourage people to do this kind of work. Yeah, and as you said earlier, the one clear winner is Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yes. <laughs> that's two, three new <laughs> Nobels. That's exactly, Harvard. that's right. Okay. Many thanks to Bloomberg's Michael McPhee. Thanks for being here, Mike. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we'll talk to Jacob Kierkegaard of the Peterson Institute for International Economics as the clock ticks down for Brexit. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio.